Welcome to the refractories. Uh, this is the new concept and uh, under the edges of uh, chemical process utilities. Now, before we discuss uh, this, uh, these refractories, uh, let us have a discussion about that what we discussed in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we discussed about the refrigeration system. Under this, uh, yes, we discussed about the cascade refrigeration system with the two stage cascade uh, refrigeration system and a three stage cascade refrigeration system. Then we discussed about the absorption refrigeration system with ammonia, water, gas diffusion and water lithium ARSs. In the water lithium, we discussed about the two uh, stages. One is the single stage ARS and uh, second one was the double stage ARS. Now, in this particular lecture, we are going to discuss about the introduction uh, to the refractories. Uh, then we will discuss about the important requirement for the uses, then how we can classify the refractories, then what different kind of the properties the refractories must possess. Uh, this including the physical properties uh, uh, which will cover about the density, porosity, abrasion, strength, etc. Then we will discuss about the thermal properties, thermal shock, thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity, then chemical properties like erosion, corrosion and ceramic properties and apart from this we will discuss about the production protocols of uh, the refractories. So, let us talk about uh, uh, the refractories. So, all refractories materials they possess a high melting point of uh, the order of uh, say 2000 degree Celsius and higher. They have the ability to retain uh, their physical shape and chemical identity when subjected to high temperatures. Most of the refractories are uh, ceramic, carbon basis of uh, organic material and is also considered as uh, uh, refractory material. Metallic materials such as uh, tungsten and molybdenum are uh, the, uh, the suitable material for the refractories. Now, when we talk about the important requirement pertaining for the user, they must have the rigidity and maintenance, uh, a proper maintenance of size and shape and strength at the operating temperature which will presumably be very high. An ability to withstand the thermal shock such as uh, it met in the heating up and the cooling down the furnace or fluctuations which occur during the charging or during the normal operation. They must offer the resistance to the chemical attack by whatever gas, slag or metal is likely to be encountered. Now, let us classify the, uh, the refractories under the heading of the classification of refractories. Now, refractories can be classified in two ways. One is um, on the basis of a chemical composition. The various refractories are like silica, SiO2, alumina Al2O3, magnesia MgO, chromia CuR2O3, alumina silicate and magnesia uh, chromia. Now, second is refractories are classified as acidic, basic or neutral refractories. This classification is based on the behavior of uh, refractories towards slag. The acidic refractories, they react with the basic slags and use uh, in uh, acidic condition. Now, in these refractories, SiO2 is the basic constituent like silica, fire clay with 30-40 percent of Al2O3, uh, silimonite and uh, andalusite with the 60 percent Al2O3. The basic refra refractories, they react with the acidic slag and therefore useful in acidic environment. They are used under basic condition and they are based on MgO that is magnesite, dolomite, uh, chrome magnesite, magnesite, chrome, alumina and mullite. Neutral refractories, they do not react with either acidic or basic slags hence useful in both acidic and basic media that is the carbon chromite FeOCr2O3 and phosphorite 2MgO SiO2. Now, certain refractories are grouped under the special refractories such as zirconia, thoria, beryllia. They have special properties that make them useful in special application that is thoria is nuclear fuel that can sustain radiation damage and uh, high temperature. Now, bricks are commonly produced from refractories in the form of standard and non-standard shapes. Standard shapes include the rectangular prism, tapered bricks and tubular sleeves. Some of the refractories are used in the form of granular form like pea sized refractories, they are used in the furnace. 
they are mixed with the hot tar as binder and used as a lining for furnace hearth insulating refractories they have very low thermal conductivity and this is achieved by the incorporation of a high proportion of air into the structure that is called the porous bricks mineral wool is another type of insulating refractory having good insulating properties with good resistance to heat but have no rigidity asbestos that, that is a new, the natural in, insulator asbestos have not a single melting point but can be used as a medium or low temperature insulation and not useful as a refractory now let's talk about the properties of refractories uh the refractories uh, properties uh, can be classified as like physical properties uh, the density porosity strength abrasion then the thermal properties the thermal shock thermal conductivity thermal diffusivity the chemical properties the corrosion and erosion so let's talk about the physical properties the physical property requirements for shaped and unshaped refractories are different for shaped refractories the main requirement are their density and porosity the dimensional tolerance for monolithic or unshaped refractories such as for plastic refractories workability and aging characteristics are the prime requirement for castable or pumpable refractories the prime requirement is the flow ability at a specific water addition with or without vibration now there are basic physical properties which are often being used to predict select and prescribe refractories for a specific application uh, the density and the porosity the strength cold and hot their importance and abrasion now let's talk about the density and porosity so when we talk about the density and porosity as a physical property then there must be some standards to assess this one then that's why the ASTM D20 standard this predicts the density and, uh, and porosity and this is one of the most important characterization tool so the higher the density uh, the lower it's the porosity and also other physical properties such as strength abrasion and gas permeability are often related to the density and porosity of the refractories and then uh, we can talk about the cold and hot strengths the physical strength in both hot and cold condition are often characterized as measure of the use of, of a refractory now the cold strength indicate the handling and installation of the refractory whereas the hot strength indicate how the refractory will perform when used as elevated temperatures the strength of refractories are measured as cold compressive strength cold modulus of rupture or hot modulus of rupture then the cold compressive strength again uh, we are using the american society for testing materials astmc 133 standard it is an indication of its suitability for use of refractories in construction and also combined measure of the refractory for the strength of grains and also of the bonding system cold modulus of rupture and again uh, we are referring to the astmc 133 it indicates the flexural strength and its suitability for use in construction it is indicative of the strength of the bonding system of the refractory product but not provides behavior at high temperature the hot modulus rupture here the astm standard is a bit different that is astm c583 now it indicates about its flexural strength at elevated temperature since refractories are used at elevated temperature the hot modulus of rupture is the true indicator of suitability and performance of a refractory at high temperature then abrasion resistance that is astm c704 it is the measure of resistance of a refractory material when high velocity particles abrade the surface of the refractory it measures the strength of the bond and the refractory particles and its resistance of the flow of high velocity particles across its surface now let's talk about uh, the thermal properties 
and thermal properties are equally important uh, compared to the physical properties. So, first thing in this aspect is the thermal expansion and the referring standard is again ASTM C113. Now, it is the measure of refractory about its linear stability when it is exposed to different ranges of temperature and then cooled to a room temperature. It is defined as the permanent linear change and is measured by the changes in the longest linear dimension. The refractory system should always be designed in such a way that the maximum temperature attainable in the system is lower than the softening or melting temperature of the refractory ingredients, grains and bonding system. Now, here you see that this uh, represents uh, uh, the expansion curve for various refractories and when we pl plot against the percentage of expansion with respect to the temperature, here you see that uh, we have represented various like thermal bricks, uh, bloating fire bricks, alumina, chrome magnesite, magnesite and silica. So, you see the sharp curve of this magnesite and then sharp uh, declination in the expansion. Now, let us talk about the thermal shock and referring standard is ASTM C uh, 1100 and 1171. This is uh, the measure of the refractory property when the refractory is exposed to alternate heating and cooling. Now, refractory is having structures with built in micro cracks of defects, this show better thermal shock resistance than with the rigid system. Now, there are two standard methods for determining the thermal shock resistance. Now, for brick shapes, the ribbon thermal shock testing that is ASTM C 1100 and for monolithic refractories, the standard method is ASTM C 1171. Now, let us talk about the thermal conductivity. Again, the referring standard is ASTM C uh, 210. Now, the thermal conductivity is a measure of the refractory regarding its ability to conduct heat from the hot to the cold space when it is exposed to high temperatures. Now, there are various standard methods for determining the thermal shock resistance. One is uh, the ASTM C210 that is a standard method for thermal conductivity of refractories. ASTM C202 that is the standard method for determining the thermal conductivity of brick. ASTM C1113 that is a conductivity of refractories by hot wire. Now, the thermal conductivity is measured as the amount of heat flow through a material in unit time per unit temperature gradient along the direction of flow and per unit cross sectional area. The thermal conductivity of a material depends on temperature, density, porosity and atmosphere. The thermal conductivity can be measured by many methods. All are grouped into two categories, one is the steady state and transient. Now, here you see that the thermal conductivity value of uh, uh, some of the refractories like insulation panel, if we represent the thermal conductivity in watt per uh, meter Kelvin, then the insulation panel it possesses 0 0.02, then insulation brick it possesses 0 0.15, fire brick 0. 80, high alumina brick 1.50, magnesia brick 5.0, the carbon brick 13.5 and graphite brick 107.0. Now, let us talk about uh, the steady state method. Now, the steady state method it involves the measurement of the heat flux between the hot and cold phase of the sample and that are uh, each kept at uh, constant temperature. One is the calorie meter method. The standard procedure is uh, usually referred in the ASTM C20198. This method is useful for material having the conductivity up to say 20 watt per meter Kelvin. 
the calorie meter is fitted at the cold face of the sample and the calorie meter obtains the mass specific heat and temperature rise of the heat flux. Another method for determination of uh, this is the split column method. Now, this uh, method is used for the measurement of uh, thermal conductivity of uh, entire brick. The brick is kept on hot plate with its large face touching the plate surface. The brick sides are insulated and a brass plate is kept on top of it. The brass plate with copper disc which is thermally insulated inserted in the center of the plate and distributes the temperature evenly. The temperature of hot plate and the copper disc are measured using thermocouples. The draught screens are erected round about the brick and the temperature of still air over the assembly is usually measured. Now, here you see that uh, this is the split column setup. The heat loss from the disc by radiation and convection is obtained using the empirical formula and the thermal conductivity is calculated using throughout uh, um, and uh, throughput and uh, temperature gradient. Now, here you see that this is uh, the common way. This is the, the bell jar and the, the base plate. Here you see that this is the temperature uh, thermal insulation powder and uh, you may keep uh, the standard test sample in at these ports and these ports are attached with the thermocouples. Here you see these are the thermocouples and the furnace is situated over here and uh, everything is aligned with the insulation brick under the edges of this mild steel. Transient method. Now, in this method, the measurements are taken after a certain amount of heat is input to the sample and the sample may initially be at room temperature. Then there is a cross array hot wire method. In this method uses a cross wire welded at the center as per the given standard in ISO 8894-1987 uh, and the other wire is the thermocouple wire. The cross wire is sandwiched between the two blocks of the refractory material. The powder is fed into the heating element for a short time and the temperature rise in the block is measured. The temperature rise is related to thermal conductivity of the material and thermal conductivity up to 2 watt per meter Kelvin can be measured by this particular method. Now, let us talk about uh, the parallel hot wire method. Now, this particular method uh, is uh, well illustrated in the standard ISO 8894-2-1990. The heating element and thermocouple wires are arranged in a parallel manner. Now, this is uh, applicable for measuring the thermal conductivity say up to 25 watt per meter Kelvin. The transient method uh, gives uh, high value than the steady state. And the difference in the transient and the steady state method, this, this is usually about 10 to 15 percent. The heat direction in steady state is unidirectional, but bidirectional in transient. The average of hot and cold surface temperature is used to measure the conductivity in steady state. Thermal diffusivity. The thermal diffusivity property is particularly useful for carbon containing materials and for this ASTM C714 is the standard method. This is used for the determining the thermal diffusivity of carbon and graphite by the thermal pulse method. Now, let us talk about the chemical properties. The chemical properties of a refractory are defined by the chemical analysis of refractory grains. Uh, by the nature of bonding, by the ability of the refractory to resist the action of liquid when exposed to higher temperature uh, with respect to the corrosion or erosion. The refractory corrosion may be caused by the mechanism such as uh, dissolution in contact with the liquid, a vapor liquid or a solid phase reaction. It may occur due to the penetration of vapor or liquid in pores. The nature and rate of dissolution of a refractory in a liquid can be calculated from a phase equilibrium diagram. 
A concentration gradient occurs in refractory composition at the boundary region when the refractory comes in contact with the molten slag. The larger the concentration gradient, the faster the dissolution rate and thus the refractory dissolves more readily. For steel making refractories, rotary slag test ASTM C874 provides close simulation of the condition in steel making refractories. Now, let us talk about the ceramic properties. Now, it is defined by its nature or reaction when exposed to heat refractories behave differently when exposed to heat depending upon the type of refractory and how it has been formed. For fired bricks, the ceramic reaction and bond have already been instituted by high temperature firing. Fired bricks such as uh, fire clay, high alumina, magnesia chrome type uh, bricks which are fired at high temperature and do not exhibit any further ceramic reaction when exposed to high temperature. For unfired refractories, the formulations uh, are designed so that the ceramic reactions are supposed to take place at those temperatures and unfired refractories such as magnesia carbon bricks, alumina carbon bricks, the formulation are designed so that the ceramic properties uh, can be developed to use uh, temperature. For monolithic refractories, the formulation are made so that the ceramic properties develop uh, when they are exposed to higher temperature. The monolithic refractories like uh, plastic, ramming mixtures, dry vibratables, mortars, coatings, they are already prepared and applied as received. In the recent development of low and ultra low cement, uh, castable, pumpable, uh, the effect of uh, ultra fine particles are of the great significance. The water requirement are low since the ultra fine silica fume particle occupy part of the space of the water. The silica fume help in reducing the water requirement in castable, it affects the high temperature properties due to the formation of anorthotic and galenite phases so at temperature around 1250 to 1400 degrees Celsius. In the recent development of sol gel bonded refractories, the high temperature properties of the castable and pumpable refractories have improved significantly at high temperature. Now, let us talk about the production of refractories. The production of refractory products start with the raw material and each kind of brick is made from different raw material and treatment. There are some common features of the in the production of refractories product. The compounds of silicon. Aluminium, magnesium, calcium, chromium, and zirconium are refractories and are found in abundance in the earth's crust. These refractory materials are found as mineral deposits that are in the form of clay, sand, ores, and rocks. These materials are mineral dressings by several different purification processes. Let us talk about the blending. Now, it is the process in which the fine particles they fill uh, the interstices between the uh, coarse particles. The porosity of the product is determined by controlling the fractional proportion of uh, uh, the different sized particles. For uniform pores, same size particles are used and blending is not at all required, but mixing will become necessary for uniform distribution of all ingredients required. The ingredients are other than the refractory powder and also called flux such as bond material and grog. The flux material reduces the melting point of refractory and needed in melting glass as well as to form a glass phase in the refractory brick. Bonding materials, they bind the hard refractory particles and gives strength to the fire product. Grog is a, uh, a pre-fired uh, material, generally scrap brick is crushed and used as grog. Sometimes grog is uh, separately made by hard firing the refractory material to produce uh, mullite grog firing at 1750 degrees Celsius. This type of refractory possesses high abrasion resistance and low gas permeability. The blending is carried out in a, in a paddle mill. Uh, with kneading action along with raw material, water and additives. Uh, the process brings uh, plasticity, 
uh, to the product as bonding agent clay absorb water and become plastic. The particle of the refractory raw material become embedded in the plastic clay. Now let us talk about the mixing. It will result in the uniformity of the various ingredients of uh, same size refractory material powder and additive to different refractory material powder and additives. The additives used may be flux, bond material and grog and the water content varies from less than say 5 percent to 20 percent. For mixture with less than 5 percent, a fine spray of water is required. Molding, because uh, uh, the shape is again very crucial uh, in the refractory aspect. So, it involves giving the shape to the product obtained after blending or mixing. Now, there are two type of molding, first is the hand molding and second one is the machine molding. Now, hand molding is a hand filled into a wooden box type of a mold with plastic mix containing about 14 to 20 percent of water. Now, this is low cost method, but a very slow. It is not used for the mass production and uh, requirement of pressure is moderate and it involves the two stage process. For non-plastic mixture and a clay containing less than say 5 percent of water, they are molded in a dry pressing with the pressure up to say 35 to 140 megapascal. Another important process is the slip casting. The suspension of fine refractory particle in water is poured into the mold of plaster of Paris. The slip casting is advantageous for making complicated shapes, but the product obtained are highly porous in nature. Drying. Once you have formed this uh, shape through mold, then next aspect is the drying. So, after successful shaping of the refractory product, the next step is the production process is drying. All the molding process used water which has to be removed from the product and this only be happened by the drying process. Now, there are two methods are being used for the drying process. First method involves the drying floors. In this particular process, the bricks are laid down in an open tray and these trays are placed in the drying floor then heated by the waste heat coming from kiln. The second method that is the tunnel kiln. The tunnel kiln are used um, you know, for drying and uh, producing regular shapes. This method gives a greater through out because continuous process. The refractory parts are stacked on uh, bogies and uh, installed in a horizontal position and these bogies are admitted at one end of the tunnel kiln which is kept heated by the stream of hot air passed through the inside of the tunnel from bottom. As the bogies they come down the kiln counter current to the hot air and a drying takes place. The speed of these bogies are adjusted in such a way that when they exit the kiln, the drying is completed. Now, this is uh, the typical shape of uh, tunnel kiln. Now, here you see that the different stages, the cooling, firing, preheating. Now, this is the gas main. So, they, they are coming from like this and after the cooling, you can discharge all these um, refractory bricks. So, in this particular chapter, we have discussed uh, about uh, the different aspect of uh, refractories, what are the ingredients, how we can classify them, what are the different uh, properties uh, with respect to the physical, thermal and chemical we can look into for the appropriate use, how we can manufacture all these uh, refractory bricks in the different shapes. We discussed all the steps which are involved in this particular manufacturing aspect. And for your convenience, we have listed couple of references and if you wish to have a further reading or further knowledge about the subject in question, you can utilize the, these references. Thank you very much.